America's Heartland is made possible by Farm Credit, financing agriculture and rural America since 1916. Farm Credit is cooperatively owned by America's farmers and ranchers. Learn more at farmcredit.com. Crop Life America, representing the companies whose modern farming innovations help America's farmers provide nutritious food for communities around the globe. Hi, I'm Sarah Gardner. Hope you're up for a wild and wooly adventure because we're taking you to the wide open spaces of America's heartland for a show that's all about sheep. Ho, ho, ho! Well, how's it going? It's wonderful so far. It could change in a heartbeat though. We'll head to Arizona where these ranchers are going from desert to mountains on a one-of-a-kind sheep drive. First place goes to RW Farms, second place RW Farms, third place uh... Come along to Idaho where sheep are the showpieces for an award-winning ranching family. We'll take you to a one-of-a-kind class where I try my hand at a bit of sheep okay. shearing. You ready? Now do I need to be holding her leg or is she okay? No, nope, she's just right like that. This grazing is something that's good for the sheep man. It's something that's good for the community. I think it's shown to be a positive for everybody. And you'll like this unusual story. We're off to Nevada to see how sheep and lambs are being used to help prevent wildfires. It's all coming up on America's Heartland. You can see it in the eyes of every woman and man In America's Heartland, living close to the land There's a love for the country and a pride in the brand in America's heartland, living close, close to the land. We're going to share some stories about these white and woolly guys on the show this time. It's amazing when you consider how American agriculture impacts our lives. I'm not only talking about the food on your breakfast or dinner table, I'm talking about products that come from animals like this. Just like beef, lamb is an important livestock product, but sheep also provide some additional benefits. There are more than five million sheep in the United States. California, Texas, and Colorado have the largest number. And those animals provide millions of pounds of wool used in everything from that sweater on your back to the carpeting in your living room. But sheep also produce fatty acids in lanolin, which is used in pharmaceuticals, cosmetics, inks, oils, and adhesive tape. And in many parts of the world, sheep are dairy animals used for cheese production. And increasingly, sheep are being used for landscape maintenance. We'll have more on that a little bit later on. But let's take you to Arizona, where ranching is just as likely to mean sheep as cattle. Our John Lobertini says being a part of one herd there means a very long walk for a summer vacation. Ho, ho, ho! Driving sheep from the desert floor to the mountains of Arizona is a yearly ritual for Dwayne Dobson and his family. The 220-mile journey will take months along the rough and winding Haberino Sheep Trail. I'm third generation in this uh, business. My granddad bought the outfit in 1929. Dwayne Dobson knows a lot about raising sheep, and he carries on the family legacy with an unflinching devotion. Like I say, it's tradition for, uh, well, all, all of Arizona. These, these driveways were established in the 1880s before Arizona was even a state. Twice a year, the Dobson clan moves 4,000 sheep to and from the higher elevations. The cooler temperatures are more favorable to the stock, and summering in the mountains provides access to better grazing land. Arizona sheep ranchers raise more than 150,000 animals each year. Good morning. How are you doing? Mark Peterson took over the job for his father-in-law 15 years ago. Yeah, it's a unique well, equation that we are able to spend that time transferring from the lower elevations up to the higher elevations, and we actually follow kind of our, the, the temperature climate up the hill. It's more like staying a step ahead of the heat. Now these sheep will travel anywhere from six to 10 miles a day, and in some cases they will do it over very rugged terrain, but they will take every bit of 45 days to make this pilgrimage to higher ground. Used to be more than a dozen ranchers guided their sheep into the mountains for mating season. But the Dobsons are the last of a dying breed, and word is spreading. Oh, look at 
So on this late April morning, crowds gathered east of Mesa to watch the flock cross the Salt River at the Blue Point Bridge. Okay, we're on the road. It's a carefully choreographed move. Mark, Wayne, and their crew bring half the herd down to a staging area, wait overnight, then race them across the bridge at sunrise. It's a fading glimpse of ranching history. Jan Stasiak has been waiting for two days. Oh, I'm very excited. Kent Miller and his grandson are playing hooky from school. I didn't want to not experience it. It was like a historic, historic event for me, so and I want to take my grandson and him to experience it. The flock moves carefully across the asphalt, then kicks it into high gear with the surge of a much bigger herd. The sheep almost instinctively know the way. Well, how's it going? Wonderful, so far. It could change in a heartbeat, though. On this day, everything goes just as planned. Cross the bridge, make a sharp left, and a cloud of dust. It's a spectacle seen few other places in modern America, and one that leaves a lasting impression. It was uh, very interesting that the sheep knew their way, where they were going. The leaders came right down and knew right where they were gonna come through the gate. <laughs> was it worth it? Well, sure, yes. I mean, how many times in your life do you get to see 2,000 sheep come by? Retired school teacher Cindy Shanks has been following the Dobson sheep for 10 months. 1,500 photographs later, Shanks says she wants to write a book titled The Great Arizona Sheep Drive. It's history, and Arizona kids don't have a lot of history because we're such a young state. And this is, this is important history. Some of this land is a short drive from urban areas, and development is slowly choking off access to these coveted trails. We were able to actually graze our sheep at different, different ranchers' uh, farm ground all the way to where we got to our own property. Now you cross about 15 Home Depots, some Lowell's, and grocery stores, and subdivisions, and uh, where it used to be all rural farm ground. Ranchers say the flock makes the journey without incident, scrambling from flatland desert to the rugged ridges of the high country. How long these annual treks can go on will depend on forces outside the flock. Encroaching civilization and redefined land use may shut down these pathways to the past. But Dwayne Dobson says, for now, the migrations will continue. The way the economics are, we're the only ones left. Oh, I don't intend to quit here unless the pressure just gets too great. There are more breeds of sheep than any other livestock species, more than a thousand worldwide. Their woolly coats are categorized by fiber length and thickness. So some sheep are great for soft sweaters, some for your winter overcoat, and some for that carpet on your living room floor. That was a very large flock of sheep in Arizona, but many farmers, even those with limited space, raise small flocks to produce wool and meat. You'll find the woolly livestock on farms and ranches all across the country. Sometimes it's an FFA or 4-H project for young people. The idea is to bring home a blue ribbon. Our Rob Stewart introduces us to a family in Idaho where showing sheep is part of their ranching success. Thank you. Meet Rachel Fleming and Danielle Nurse. Some might call them the queens of competition when it comes to livestock shows. That's because these sheep sisters from RW Farms are taking home more than their share of prizes at the Western Idaho Fair in Boise. First place goes to RW Farms, second place RW Farms, third place uh... Suffice it to say, these sisters are a crowd favorite, with winning sheep judged on size, cleanliness, and overall presentation. It's good. It's good. It feels good when you spend a lot of time on the sheep and you're going to all the national shows trying to buy the best, to breed the best. A lot of hard work paid off. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Each sheep can take weeks of work to get show ready. It's especially hard to groom and form the wool coats. It's just pure wool. It's really soft. You get money for this. Mm hmm yes. Get premiums, yes. It can be a business. Definitely. That business began when a young Rachel Wilbur was just eight years old. She began bringing home sheep, and along with her sisters and parents, planted the roots of the family's RW Farms, named after young Rachel. 
Well, they started getting involved and actually we got up to 100 views and we've been cutting down because <laughs> the kids all left. <laughs> I'd say you took it to an entirely new level. <laughs> yeah. The first priority is getting the rams out. The day starts early at the Wilbur family farm in nearby Nampa, Idaho. Raising sheep for breeding stock, meat sales, wool, and of course, competition. From the beginning, it has been an all in the family affair. Can you throw it clear down there? Do it. The Wilbers see their sheep business as more than just raising livestock. Brian and Dee have full time jobs off of the farm, but working with their daughters and showing sheep in competition allows them to share a bit about agriculture with an audience that's never been to the country. So many people don't know anything about it anymore. We had a little girl recently that uh, got a hold of the sheep and said, wow, that feels like cotton. You know, they, they had no idea what wool was, but at least they knew what cotton was. But uh, agriculture just getting kind of lost in the mix. What is that, Cheyenne? On this morning, the Boise Fair delivers one of those hands-on lessons. That's another big plus about bringing these animals out here is to educate the public. The money you make in agriculture is very, very small, and so you gotta love what you're doing, and um, the general public needs to understand what you're doing too. You wanna touch it again? Whether it's education, business, or competition, the ribbons are a crowning achievement for a job well done, no matter the reason. And so this is what makes it all worthwhile for you? Yes, yes. <laughs> it's, it's like the end of a lot of work, yeah. A lot of work. <laughs> to get We've recognized, seen that. yeah. Mm -hmm. And to have fun, it is. It's nice to be recognized for all of this. Raising sheep is one of the oldest agricultural endeavors in the world, with herds of sheep domesticated more than 10,000 years ago. When Columbus sailed to the New World, he brought sheep with him, and by 1698, American farmers were already exporting wool to Europe. For those farmers and ranchers who raise sheep for their wool, a haircut is a necessary part of the business. The sheep are generally shorn once a year, and the wool is sent away to be cleaned, perhaps dyed, and then fashioned into fabrics and clothing. Sheep shearing is big business in the major sheep rearing countries of the world. Think Australia. But let's say you're a novice in the sheep rearing game, and you need to learn a little bit about giving your woolly lambs a trim. You might head back to school. <laughs> For many consumers, wool is the ultimate choice in materials to create high-end fabrics. Australia, New Zealand, and Argentina far outshine U.S. wool production. But you'll find sheep ranchers all across the heartland, some of them looking to acquire an essential skill. Down, all the way around to the back side. From hamstring to hamstring. Shearing a sheep may look like the simple act of getting a haircut, but there's a lot more to it than just moving your shears along the fluffy wool. That's a lesson these students have come to learn at Middle Tennessee State University. Straight down, make that a nice straight line. The university's two-day course draws students from a number of states. Some are ranchers, some just looking to develop a marketable skill. Somebody that owns a, a dozen, 15, 25 uh, uh, sheep, and they, they want to learn how to shear their own sheep. In some cases, uh, uh, they may not even actually want to shear their sheep, but they want to occasionally be able to do some shearing. You know, uh, a lot of people like to, to, to clean up, uh, up the sheep just a little bit uh, before lambing, for example. One father-daughter team was among the students in this class. She's doing better than me. She's Michael Stringer says he and his daughter Abigail had the sheep and wanted to discover the best way to access the wool. She got into Jacob sheep last year and part of the uh, agreement was that she had to learn to do something with the wool to keep them on the farm. So uh, we're now it's time for us to learn how to shear them and uh, we didn't know what to do. While the wool may look soft and easy to handle, Abigail discovered that shearing comes with its own challenges. It was different than I expected it to be. I guess I sort of thought it would just be really easy. 
but it takes a lot of maneuvering and everything. And it really hurts your back. You can maybe get by going by just like this here. The primary instructor for this shearing session is Doug Rathke, right. sharing skills he's acquired over many years. But my sheep that I've got is starting to get to be a taller sheep. And if she's one of them sheep that just will not let me take that leg and tuck it away. Doug's training has taken him to New Zealand, a country that has at least 10 times more sheep than people. I finished the senior level of the classes, which took me three tries. It's uh, weeks long every time. And uh, finally, after the third one, I made the senior level, and you gotta be able to shear 300 a day, every day. Shearing sheep demands a steady hand, the ability to work the wool fast, and the stamina to maintain control over the animal. It looks like it's extremely physically demanding. It does take a lot out of you. You got that real quick. And just to get them in the right spot and hold them. They don't cooperate as much as we'd like, but sure it's not comfortable for them either. In one hour shearing, you expend as much energy as a jogger would running eight miles. The yeah, lessons right. here reinforce concepts that protect the person doing the shearing while providing a safe and reliable approach for the sheep. The moves that I use is the most comfortable for both sheep and the shearer make it easier so we can get it done the quickest. And while an expert can make the job look easy, some students literally wrestle with their lessons, controlling the animal, repositioning to start again, and finally getting a handle on equipment and sheep. What's the most difficult part of all this, do you think? Um, remaining calm. <laughs> I don't know, it gets really stressful, I think. You know, they start moving and you don't feel like you're doing the right thing. And actually, once you start shearing them, they get really slippery. And so it's hard to hold on to them. So are you willing to give me a lesson? Because I would really like to give it a try. You really want to? I really want to. OK. <laughs> no one's twisting my arm. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Watching someone else try their hand is a lot different than facing the task yourself. Part of it is remembering to do a whole series of things at the same time. You ready? Now, do I need to be holding her leg, or is she okay? No, nope, she's just right like that. Oh, you want to start right here. Right in here? Yep. And I need to be holding the skin. There you go. Try and take this wool off right here. Follow my hand. Come, come back here a little bit more. <laughs> I'm not giving you a very clean cut, am I? That's all right. It's your first time, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. And I'm like everybody else. I'm scared to death of cutting her. Yeah, yep. Am I not getting down deep enough? Yeah, you got to lay it right down on the skin. Don't worry, that camera's right on you. I know, and I'm doing kind of a messy job. It's embarrassing. Okay, I should have practiced a time or two. Well, you do a four or five more, you'll be good. <laughs> Wool has long been a natural, versatile, and renewable resource. But like other commodities, the interest in raising sheep and selling wool will rise and fall with the market. Just go straight down. See how I grab that leg? And if you want to do the math on that final paycheck. In the last few years, we've come around 50 to 60 cents a pound. A ewe will give uh, about seven pounds of, of wool. So we're talking about, you know, three or four dollars worth of wool uh, off of a sheep. You got to really maneuver that. Late. As with many other educational experiences, these skills don't come easy. They can come, however, with a sense of satisfaction. At the end of the first day, uh, the students are just beginning to realize how difficult it is. And then they'll start making progress. So at the end of the second day, when they shear their last sheep and, and it came, the wool came off in one piece, it looks good, the, the animal is, is, uh, is, is in good shape, everybody's happy, that's when we're all uh, uh, feeling real good about things. You've got your choice when it comes to sheep. There are more than a thousand breeds worldwide with more than 40 in the U.S. alone. And while most farmers raise white wool sheep, natural wool colors also include black, gray, silver, brown, and red, even spotted varieties. And a bit of sheep trivia for you, because they were such an important animal for early farmers, sheep are mentioned several hundred times in the Bible. Can't tell the difference between a sheep and a goat? Goat's tails go up, sheep tails hang down. 
I mentioned earlier that sheep are increasingly being used for landscape maintenance. We've taken you out west to farms and ranches where sheep and goats control weeds and eat their way through large expanses of grassland. Well, our Jason Schultz takes us to Nevada where one community has turned to sheep to help prevent wildfires. <laughs> American ranchers raised more than 5 million sheep and lambs in 2011. Not only livestock that ended up on your dinner table, but animals that provided nearly 30 million pounds of wool for things like sweaters and suits. <coughs> Ted Borda's family has been ranching these woolly animals for nearly a century. My family's been in the sheep business here in Nevada since 1914. My grandfather came from France. Uh, herd sheep for his brother, and, and uh, by 1918, 17, he was married, and by 1920, he owned his own sheep. And we've been in the sheep business since then. Ted is a retired teacher. He turned to full-time sheep ranching a decade ago. You spend time with the sheep as a kid, growing up with them and stuff. It's just, it's just a, a place you like to be in life. It's a good place to be. For the most part, Ted's 3,000 sheep graze open areas in northwest Nevada, but come spring, they take on a different task, tied to a disaster that happened in 2004. It was then that an explosive wildfire called the Waterfall Fire consumed nearly 9,000 acres near Nevada's capital of Carson City. That blaze injured five people, destroyed some two dozen structures, and threatened more than 500 homes and businesses before it was brought under control. As the sun came up and more resources responded, this fire continued to grow and literally ran south to north across the entire face here of western Carson City. Fire investigators later pointed to a non-native plant called cheatgrass as a major source of fuel that fed that fast-moving fire. It is an annual grass. You know, it dries out early in the spring. Uh, it's a very fine textured grass, and so it's very easy to ignite and burns very rapidly. Carson City officials knew something had to be done to control the cheatgrass to help prevent future fires. Considering options for eradicating the cheatgrass, residents favored targeted grazing over things like herbicides and controlled burns. With that feedback, officials reached out to sheep ranchers like Ted Borda. His livestock will graze on land adjacent to homes and commercial property. The city covers his cost of transporting the sheep. It was $20 million to fight the fire. They lost another $18 million in homes. So this is a pretty cheap way to, you know, knock down those fuels. So if you have a fire, you can control it. The sheep will only eat the cheap grass in the spring when the plant is short, green, and tender. It's a good feed right now. They like it, they'll eat it. But once it goes from green to start carrying out and turning red, it sends up its seed stock. And when the seeds are soft, they'll eat it. But when the seeds start getting hard, they won't touch it. And then we only have about three weeks or so until it matures and it turns green, it turns red, and then it turns brown through the summer, and that's why it's a fire hazard. During the early spring, the sheep can plow through a lot of cheatgrass. If we have about 800 sheep using approximate numbers of forage of what they will eat and through the week, we're anticipating about 13 tons of fuel being reduced off the landscape per week. Civic leaders say their targeted grazing is a green approach to reducing the fire hazard. We pride ourselves in Carson City about open space, and we pride ourselves on good, uh, prudent management of that open space. And the, the, the sheep grazing is good for not only uh, fuel management, but it's just good to tell people, you know what, you can use nature to take care of nature. As for the sheep, well, many residents here will tell you they're happy to have them in their backyards. It's very low impact. Um, I think the public is very accepting to it, um, and it's going to be successful. And Ted Borda believes the program also showcases his sheep as being a community asset. This grazing 
is something that's good for the sheep man. It's something that's good for the community. I think it's shown to be a positive for everybody. That's going to do it for this edition of America's Heartland. Thanks for traveling the country with us. We're always pleased to take you along as we discover such interesting people and places. Before we go, just a reminder to check out the offerings at our America's Heartland website, americasheartland.org. You'll find video from today's show and lots of other attractions as well. And don't forget, you can also connect to us through many of your social media websites. We'll see you next time on America's Heartland. You can purchase a DVD or Blu-ray copy of this program. Here's the cost. To order, just visit us online or call 888-814-3923. You can't see it in the eyes of every woman and man In America's heartland, living close to the land There's a love for the country and a pride in the brand In America's heartland, living close, close to the land America's Heartland is made possible by Farm Credit, financing agriculture and rural America since 1916. Farm Credit is cooperatively owned by America's farmers and ranchers. Learn more at farmcredit.com. Crop Life America, representing the companies whose modern farming innovations help America's farmers provide nutritious food for communities around the globe.